Hey guys, it's Chris at Highline Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, I'll have earned your subscription. And of course, to everyone who's watching, if you like the video, please click that thumbs up button. I cannot stress enough how important it is to click that thumbs up button. Not only does it tell YouTube to promote my videos to other folks with similar interests, but it tells YouTube what kind of videos you like to watch so that when you visit YouTube, you're gonna be served up the kind of videos that you enjoy and not a bunch of gunk that you could care less about. Okay, so in today's video, what I'm gonna talk about is the process that I follow in order to make a 3D model of a guitar neck. And this is a process that it can be fairly complicated. And it's the whole point of making 3D models is so that you can, well, there's actually a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a great way to tell whether or not a design idea that you have is actually going to work. When you see it in 3D, you can oftentimes see issues that may come up that might interfere with that uh, particular part's ability to function correctly. So if you build a full 3D model of your, the guitar that you're uh, hoping to build, you can start to see how the parts relate to one another and whether or not there's going to be any issues. And that saves you a lot of time and money in the long run, especially if you're going to be using exotic woods to make your guitar. Last thing you want to do is cut out a body or a neck and find out that the parts aren't going to work well together. They're, maybe they're not going to line up properly or you didn't consider where to place the pickups and things like that. But if you build it in 3D, you can see that. But also for me, the main reason for making a 3D model is I use that model to establish the tool paths and write the G code that I'm gonna to use to cut those parts on my CNC machine. So that's one of the reasons why I use um, 3D modeling. Now, the software that I'm gonna be using there's two software programs that I rely on primarily for creating 3D models. The first is Adobe Illustrator, which is a two-dimensional uh, vector-based drawing program. You can also use a CAD program, um, the, the sort of software that you use to create blueprints and, and plans and things like that. I also use, for the actual 3D modeling, Rhinoceros version 7, for the Macintosh. Now, um, there is a version 8 out. However, it just came out a couple weeks ago, and I need to make a lot more videos and sell a lot more guitar plans and tool plans before I'll be able to afford to make that upgrade from version 7 to version 8. However, most of the commands that I use for the work that I do uh, haven't really changed from version 7 to version 8, so I'm not too concerned with updating right away. And like I said, I'm working on a Mac, so any of the key commands that I use, um, I'll try to describe those as I'm working uh, in this video, but I'm only gonna describe the Mac key commands. And if you wanna know how those translate to Windows, um, you know, it's a simple matter of understanding what the option key is, what the command key is, uh, control, that sort of thing, and how that translates over to Windows. And once you've figured that out, it's pretty easy to translate when I say, you know, command J or option delete, you know, whatever, um, you can convert that over to what the Windows commands are. So that shouldn't be that big of an issue. Now, before I get started, I want to explain the basic concept of 3D modeling, or at least the basic concept from my perspective. It's the thing about 3D modeling is there are a lot of different ways to do the same thing. So my way is a way that I have found to be really successful, at least for me, and I think it would be for you as well. What you have to do is you have to be able to think of a three-dimensional shape as a collection of individual shapes that start out as two-dimensional shapes. So for example, a headstock. The headstock starts out as a two-dimensional perimeter shape. We then add thickness to it, which makes it three-dimensional. 
as you're creating 3D models, you have to be able to, in your mind, think through how a shape, what that shape is, and then how you're going to convert that flat two-dimensional shape into a three-dimensional object. You're going to use the two-dimensional shapes that you create in a vector-based program like Adobe Illustrator or a CAD drafting program. You're going to take those two-dimensional shapes and then you're going to extract them out to create the three-dimensional model. But before you can do that, you have to think in your mind how you need to build those two-dimensional shapes in order to create that 3D model. Now, another example that I can give you, which I hope will help to explain this concept of thinking in 2D in order to create a 3D model is the back contour of a guitar neck. When you look at a guitar neck like this one here, if you're looking at it, you know, top down, you'll see that you basically have two lines that converge towards the headstock. That's the basic two-dimensional shape of the neck. And this actually extends into the body where the heel is. But those are two lines that uh, extend all the way up to the headstock. But there's another shape that you have to consider. And that is the contour. This rounded contour that you see. If you were to cut the neck with a table saw at any point, along its length, you'll see that there is a sort of half round U-shaped or C-shaped or D-shaped, whatever, um, profile. Um, it's a cross section. That's the other shape that you have to think about. Because to build this three-dimensional shape, we're going to need to know what that contour um, cross-sectional shape is. Now, typically when I build a neck in, in 3D, when I build the model, as you will see later on here, I will create two cross-sectional, two-dimensional shapes. One is up here towards the headstock, um, right where it transitions into the volute. That's one cross-section. It's the, the same width and thickness as the neck, and it has that U shape. Then I'll do another one down here at the heel, right where it transitions into the heel. I'll do another cross-sectional shape that's the same width, the, the, the thickness that I want, and then that, that U shape or C shape that I want down here. Now, because they're two-dimensional, in the drawing, they're laying flat. So when I bring it into the 3D model, I'll flip them up vertical, and then I will build a framework between the two cross sections. It's sort of like a skeleton, like a rib cage. Then I cover that with a surface or a skin. And that's what creates the 3D shape. So that's a way of, of hopefully better understanding what I'm talking about when I say you need to think in how you would take a two-dimensional shape and bring it into... A 3D program and then build the 3D model from that two-dimensional shape. This is all going to make sense as we jump onto the computer and I show you how I do this. But it's important to understand now that there's this, this way of thinking is so important and it's how you can achieve success when building a 3D model. So many people out there um, will uh, contact me with questions about 3D modeling, and it becomes clear that they don't understand how to think between two dimension and three dimension, and how to make that transition, and how to use your two dimensional drawing components as the um, template for building your 3D model. So let's jump on the computer and we'll get started. In order to lay out the neck, we really have to lay out the whole guitar. Now, we don't have to get into minute detail here. We just need to get the perimeter shapes of the body and then the neck itself so that we can make sure that the layout, the design, is actually going to, to work. So the first thing I've got to do is set up a document, and this document size is 48 inches wide, 38, uh, 36 inches tall. 
and I make all my plans this size. Uh, that's what I do the PDF files uh, that I sell on my eGuitar Plans website, as well as in my um, Highline Guitars merch store. And this is so that I can create a full size drawing of the entire guitar and still have enough room to do the neck, the body, and the fretboard separately in the same sheet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start laying out the neck, but to do so I have to make sure I have the body laid out as well because I've got to make sure everything is going to work well together. Now I'm not going to show you every single keystroke and uh, all the different techniques that I use to create drawings in Adobe Illustrator, uh, the vector-based drawings, because you may not use Adobe Illustrator. You might use a different vector-based drawing program or you may simply jump straight into Rhinoceros and create your um, 2D elements right there in the 3D program, which is certainly an option. I would do that myself if I wasn't using these Adobe Illustrator files for other purposes. So uh, the first thing that I need to do is I'm going to create a center line because everything regarding a guitar's design has to revolve around the center line, the placement of the body, the neck, the fretboard, the pickup pockets, the neck cavity, all of that is going to depend on where that center line is located. So I have already created a center line, and that's what you see here on this um, uh, on the screen right here. This is the, the center line, it's just a dashed line. Next, I'm going to add the shape of the body. Now, obviously, the shape is dependent upon whatever you want that shape to be. Um, it might be a strat shape, it might be a telly shape, Les Paul, whatever. Um, my guitar shapes, I try to create my own shapes, my own original designs, and they're generally based on the overall width and length and thickness of other existing guitars. Uh, there's no point in reinventing the wheel here. I could create some really unique shapes, but I prefer to keep the shapes somewhat familiar. So I've created this body shape, and this is a double cutaway shape. And as you can see, it's laid out right on that center line. Now from here, I need to figure out how the neck is going to be laid out relative to the body. Now in the last episode where I made the 3D fretboard, I used a program called FretFind 2D to lay out that fretboard. And that is a, a web-based application. And I created the layout and saved it as a PDF file to my computer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that layout to help determine how the neck is going to be laid out into this design. So I simply open up that uh, PDF file, copy the elements, and then paste them in to my layout here. And I orient it so that I have the fretboard positioned where I want it to be relative to the body. And I'm considering a couple of things here. First of all, the position of the bridge, and then where the fretboard meets the body. And on the treble side, the body intersects the fretboard at the 22nd fret, and then on the bass side, it intersects at the 19th fret. Now, as you can see, this is a multi-scale fan fret design. However, the same um, concept applies if it was just a standard uh, one scale fretboard. So that's how I've got it laid out. And from here, the next thing I can do is lay out the pocket because I need to have the pocket shape because I'll use that pocket shape to build the heel when I make the 3D model. Now it's going to be kind of hard to see the position of the neck pocket because the fretboard's in the way. So I'm going to turn off the fretboard for just a minute and now I'll turn on the neck pocket and you can see how that neck pocket was created or its basic shape. But if you look closely, when I turn the fretboard layout back on, you'll see that the neck pocket actually stops short of the end of the fretboard. And the reason for that is because I like to have overhang at the end of the neck. 
I like the fretboard to overhang a little bit. That conceals the uh, seam between where the body and the neck meet at the end. It also will give me a little extra wood between the end of the neck pocket and the pickup pockets. So if I show you the pickup pockets, which are laid out like so, you can see as I zoom in that there is space between the pickup pocket, the end of the fretboard, and then even more space between the pickup pocket and the end of the neck pocket. And that just gives me a little bit more wood there. It also allows me the option of, if I decided to create um, a trim ring for these pickups, which I'm not going to do, but if I were to do that, I would have space for the side of that trim ring. So that is how I lay out the neck pocket. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to establish the neck perimeter. And the neck perimeter is basically just follows that perimeter shape of the fretboard. So if I bring that in and then turn off the fretboard layout, you can see the neck perimeter now. Now I can leave the fretboard layout off for now. I don't need it because we now see where the perimeter of the neck is. And the next thing I have to do is add in where the nut is going to be placed. And that's at the very end. If I zoom in here, you can see I just added that nut. Um, that's actually a shelf for the nut to sit on. So that will be positioned right here. Now the next thing I need to do um, and actually I need to bring my uh, fretboard layout back in because it has the strings. The next thing I need to do is extend the strings straight off of that nut. Now I like to do a straight string pull, so I'm just going to draw straight lines that come off of the, the nut. And this is what that looks like. And these are just drawn straight out. They come to an end here on the right side of my uh, canvas. However, uh, when I lay out the tuners, that's going to change here in just a second. But what I can do now is I can establish the position of my tuner holes. So the first hole that I need to create represents the diameter of the post of the tuner. And this is about it's a little bit less than a quarter of an inch or uh, about six millimeters in diameter. And as you can see, that circle lines up at the top with that string. They intersect right at the very top. That's where the string will contact the post as it wraps around it. But then I need to draw a, a circle for the actual body of the tuner's um, the shaft itself. So that's going to be about 3 eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters in diameter. So I create those two elements and I have them positioned. This is roughly where I would like them to be relative to the neck. So then what I'll do is I will select those two and then what I need to do is I need to make a copy of it and move it over. So I will hold down shift and command and press M and that brings up the move dialog. So I want to move it horizontally. And in this case, I like to move it one and a sixteenth inches or about 27 millimeters. So I will type in 1.0625 and then I don't want to click OK because that would move the whole tuner over, the, the, the two holes over. I just want to make a copy of it. So I click copy and that creates a copy that's exactly 1.0625 or a six, one in the 16th inches or 27 millimeters over to the right. But then I need to move this up so that this inner circle is lined up with this next string. So this is the high E string and this will be the B string. So what I'll do is I'll move my cursor until I see the word anchor appear. That means I'm right over that top anchor of that inner circle. I'll click and hold, hold down the shift key and drag it up until it is lined up 
right there on that top string. So now I have my next tuner hole in position. And I'm going to do this for each string all the way up. And remember, this is going to be a reverse headstock. So the tuners will be on the bottom of the headstock instead of on the top, like you would see on a, like a uh, Stratocaster or a Telecaster. These will be reversed and on the other side. So I will create those other ones. And what I end up with is something that looks like this. And I have all those holes positioned correctly. From here, I can then start to lay out the shape of my headstock. Now, the shape of a headstock can be somewhat limited by some of the features that you want for the headstock. For example, in this case, I have a reverse headstock. I have all the tuners lined up, so that's another limiting factor. And then the other is that I have a straight string pull coming off the nut. So that kind of limits the different shapes that you can create for your headstock. You know, you can do a lot of things around it, but you've got to make sure that when you install the tuners that you're going to have enough clearance for the uh, tuning peg knob to, uh, to be able to turn it without it running into the headstock. So after playing around with this for a while, I've come up with the final headstock shape. Now, before I show you that, uh, what I can do is I can also shorten these strings to where they come in contact with each tuner. That's how I shorten the strings so that they are contacting each of the tuners. Now what I can do is I can show you the shape that I created for the headstock. And this is that shape. This will work just fine. Now this is the top of the headstock. And remember what I said about imagining or envisioning your guitar neck as a series of shapes. This is one of those shapes, the headstock shape, but this is the top of the headstock. It ends right at the nut. So if I turn off the nut and the neck perimeter and the fretboard layout, you can see where that, um, the headstock, where it comes into contact with the nut. So I'm going to bring those elements back in. And now what I need to do is show you the other part of the headstock, which is the back of the headstock, because it's slightly different. Now when I bring that in, all you see change is you suddenly see a volute appear. However, it's actually the entire shape of the headstock. So if I turn off the top headstock, all you see is this headstock perimeter with that volute. Okay, so with the top and the back of the headstock indicated, the next element we have to create is the slot for the truss rod. Now remember, we're, we're looking at this from the top down. We're, so what we have to do is we have to create the slot for the truss rod top down. So we're looking at the top part of it. And what we're concerned with is indicating the length and the width of the truss rod. And it's important to understand, you know, there are a lot of different kind of truss rods out there. And typically your adjustment nut is not going to be the same dimension as the rod itself. So you'll need to take that in, you know, into consideration as you lay out the truss rod slot. But what I have done here on the screen, I'll back out a little bit, is I have indicated the truss rod, but so that it's easier to see, I'm gonna switch off the layout of the fretboard and then I'll bring in that slot. And there you can see I have the slot indicated. I have the, this long rectangle is the main body, which is this blue part on the truss rod. Then I have a slightly wider rectangle at the, uh, to the right of that longer rectangle, and that's where the adjustment nut fits. Then I have another one, which is a little bit harder to see. I'll have to turn off the strings, and I'll zoom in a little bit. This part here, this is where you would access the adjustment nut 
with your Allen wrench. Now, like I said, there are a lot of different kinds of truss rods out there. So really, I think it's important to have your truss rod. In fact, I, I always stress that you should buy all the components that you're going to use in your guitar before you start doing any sort of cutting and carving. Well, in this case, because we're doing it with CNC and 3D models, I would recommend that you do your layout first and then once you figure out how everything is going to fit and that it's all going to work, then you can start to purchase all the components. But then once you get the components and have them in your hand, you can start to measure out their dimensions and then include those in your drawing and fine tune it. Um, yes, you can get some of those dimensions by reading descriptions on uh, you know, wherever you purchase them or whoever you purchase them from or the manufacturer's websites, but you'll find oftentimes they're not accurate. It's best to actually have the tool or the component in your hand so that you can measure it and get an accurate measurement. So once we have the truss rod slot indicated, the final item that we need to indicate for building the 3D model is the contour um, cross section. And I will do two cross sections, one right up close to the nut and then one close to the heel. So let me show you how those look. These are the two cross-sectional elements. There's one up here at the close to the, the nut end or the headstock end, and then one close to the heel. Now these indicate the actual start, which would be at the nut, and then the finish, which is at the heel. And they're positioned based on how I want that contour to transition into the volute at the headstock end and then how I want it to transition into the heel at the end at the other end of the neck and this is going to make a little bit more sense once we start to model it but everything is laid out um, flat at this stage it's obviously two-dimensional once I bring this into 3d I will flip these up 90 degrees and then use those to build out that contour shape. Now, as far as how I determine this contour, this curve, that's totally up to you. This is, it's based on whether you want a C shape, a U shape, a D shape, and you know, it's all, it's all dependent upon what you're after. So you can kind of play around with these shapes until you get exactly the shape that you want. Um, you're not actually going to know what this is going to be until you've carved the neck on your CNC machine. And I know some guys will carve in foam first to kind of to do like a mock-up to see what it's going to be like. You could also do a mock-up uh, carved in like pine wood and then decide if that's the shape that you like. If not, you can go in and modify it. Um, one of the things that I would stress is important to be aware of is that you want this shape to be able to encompass your truss rod. If you make it too thin, you could expose the truss rod when you try to carve it on your CNC machine. So you want to make sure that it's going to encompass that. Um, but that's pretty much how I create the basics of this layout. Now, once I've got everything laid out and I'm happy with how it's going to um, it's going to work, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select just the elements, the components of the neck. And I don't even need the center line at this point because it's all pretty much done. And I don't necessarily need the tuner holes either because this is an angled headstock and to drill tuner holes with a CNC machine on an angled headstock the most efficient way to do it is to have a four or five axis CNC machine. However, most consumer and even a lot of the professional uh, grade CNC machines don't have a fourth or fifth axis, which allows you to tilt the spindle at an angle. If you're just using a three axis CNC machine, the easiest way to, to drill the tuner holes is just simply uh, take the neck over to a drill press and drill the holes that way, which is typically how I do it. But I'm going to include the tuner holes in the 3D model in case some of you out there have access to a four-axis CNC machine. You'll be able to drill the holes when you do the CNC work. 
But at this stage, what I'm going to do is I am going to copy these elements. So I will select them all and then I will hold Command C to copy them. Now I'm going to create a new document and this is going to be five inches wide and in this case I'm going to do 32 inches tall. These dimensions represent the dimensions of the blank that I'm going to be cutting this out of, at least as far as the width and the length. This doesn't consider the depth, that's something that will be handled later. But for now, uh, this is what the physical dimensions of the width and the length are for the blank that I will be cutting this out of. So I'll hit create and that's the document. So when I paste it by holding command V, the neck is coming in laid out uh, horizontally and I want to rotate it so that it's vertical. So what I will do is simply rotate that document and this is what it looks like once it's laid out. So from here I can save this file as an Adobe Illustrator file and I would probably call it six string multi-scale guitar neck and I'll save it to my computer and then I'm going to use this uh, layout to start building my 3D model in Rhinoceros. Okay, now before I can import this Illustrator file into Rhinoceros, there's a couple of things that I need to change. And that is, first of all, if you look up at the headstock, you will notice I still have those circles for the tuning posts, and I don't need those. So I can just select those and delete them. You know, after all, I'm not going to be modeling the tuning post. I'll model the holes that the tuners fit in, but I'm not going to be modeling the posts themselves. The other item I can get rid of is the indication of where the nut is going to sit. Um, I'm not going to model that. Uh, it's just, just a shelf, so I can delete that. But then you see I have a gap here. So what I have to do is I have to go up to the left toolbar and select the white arrow and I'll come down here and I'll just click on that anchor point and drag it up until it snaps to the headstock anchor point and I'll do the same on the other side. So now I have that part of the perimeter set. Now another thing I have to do and this this is where things start to get confusing about 3D modeling, and, and I think it's where a lot of folks tend to get confused. When you're modeling in 3D, you're, you're bringing these elements into Rhinoceros, or you're creating them directly in Rhinoceros. But you have to think about the orientation that you're modeling. When I look at this uh, Illustrator file on my screen, we're looking at it from the top down. It's as if we were placing the guitar on a table and then looking straight down. That's the orientation we see here. And that's how it would be imported into Rhinoceros. When I start to build the 3D model, I have to consider this orientation. Now, when I build a 3D model, I like to build the neck in particular from the back to the top rather than from the top to the back. Now you can do it that way. You can do it from the top to the bottom, but I like to do it from the bottom to the top or the back to the top. So what I have to do is I have to flip this orientation because right now it's like I said, it's we're looking at it from the top down. I want to be looking at it from the bottom up. So I just simply select all the elements and I go over here to my right toolbar to the Reflect tool, and then I double-click that, and it automatically flips the orientation. And that's the orientation that I want when I build this in uh, Rhinoceros. This will make sense as we get into it, uh, the actual modeling, but you're going to want to probably play around with importing your elements into Rhinoceros and start building a 3D model and you'll see how that orientation, how that works. So now that I've got this, I can then 
bring this into Rhinoceros and start building the 3D model. All right, guys. Well, I think that is where I'm going to call it a day with this uh, episode, part one. Um, I had originally planned to try to do this whole tutorial in one video, but the time it was going to take to shoot all the video of the 3D modeling process and then edit everything down meant that I wasn't going to have a video to upload this week and I didn't want to do that. So I'm going to call this one part one. And then in the next episode, I'm going to import those Illustrator vector elements into Rhinoceros and build the 3D model. So I encourage you to check back next week uh, if you'd like to follow along as I build this 3D model of the neck. Uh, in the meantime, though, um, as always, if you've enjoyed the content in this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button. That's so important. And you know, if you want to help to support the channel financially so that I can upgrade my Rhinoceros 7 to Rhinoceros 8, you can visit eGuitarPlans.com or my Highline Guitars merch shelf. And whatever purchase you make there uh, is going to help to support this channel financially. Um, there are links in the description below to both of those sites. And then, of course, if you want to keep it simple, you can just click the thanks button and leave a tip in the amount that you think is fair. At any rate, until that next episode, take care, stay safe, and I hope you'll be back for part two of this exciting 3D modeling tutorial build.